Hi, everyone. Um, so today we're going to be talking about Cloudy with a Chance of Chaos, verifying the resiliency of cloud-native applications. So first, a little about myself. I'm Bella Wiseman. Um, I work at Goldman Sachs. I've been have te for 10 years of experience in financial services technology. My mother was also a software engineer, so that makes me a second-generation woman software engineer. Um, so I'll just go through our agenda. Um, we'll start with what is chaos engineering. Then we'll go over chaos readiness. Um, we'll go through a case study of a chaos experiment we actually did on a real Goldman Sachs system. And then we'll go through some takeaways. So chaos engineering, you'll find official definitions online. Um, this is my definition. Right? Find your next production incident before it finds you, right? So that means kind of deliberately doing things that cause production incidents okay, so that you can determine what the impact will be. Right, this can be an environment, um, but essentially you know, doing something like doing a bad trigger or that might cause a production incident. And then you know, hopefully the impact won't be a product incident, but if it is, you know, you're able to actually see what that impact is. So the classical example, which is how this whole thing started, is bringing down a machine. Right, bringing down the machine that one of the machines that your that your um, application is running on. So I look at there as being five parts to running a chaos test. Right, first of all, defining your success criteria, understanding what you're trying to achieve. Right, two being defining and measuring the steady state of your system. Three, injecting the failure. So that's the actual chaos test itself. Four, observing the outcome, seeing what happens, and then five, if required restoring your system back to steady state. So what does defining your success criteria mean in this context, right? It's what does success mean for this test? Are you expecting no impact to availability? Everything should just continue to run as expected. Um, minimal impact to availability, in which case the question is how much impact is acceptable, right? Three, a self-healing system Right? There will be impact, but you expect the system to be able to recover on its own without outside intervention, in which case the question is, after how long? And then four, perhaps you're looking for, you know, there will be impact, maybe even manual intervention required, and you want an alert to be triggered. You want your support person, your on-call to be paged, right? And then five, you also might want to check that your dashboards are actually reflecting the system state, showing that you have an issue. That might be another thing you want to determine from the chaos test. So let's go into defining and measuring your steady state. Right? So when we talk about steady state, it's like how your system is supposed to behave if everything is going well. Um, and typically, when we talk about observability and resilience, we talk about an SLO, a service level objective. And that's usually measured actually over a longer period of time, so something like a 30 days. You might say, we want 99.9% .9 of requests to return a successful response. Um, over a 30-day or 90-day period. And that's extremely important because you don't want to be impacted by little blips, you know, for five minutes something happened, for three minutes something happened. Um, you want to be able to maintain that SLO consistently over the long term. But for chaos tests, that actually doesn't work very well, right? Because running your chaos test for a 30-day period, at least I, you know, I hope not, you want to get results much quicker than that. You might, in a one-minute interval, 30 seconds, five seconds, you want to get your answers more quickly. Right? So what I find is actually more helpful than an SLO in determining the success or failure of your chaos test is actually something like your alerting threshold, right? when you would actually reach out and page somebody to take a look at something. And if you breach your alerting threshold during the chaos test, right, that would mean that something bad did happen. And if you don't breach the alerting threshold, that means that everything is kind of working as, it's, as expected. But obviously, you might also discover that your alerting threshold is not what it's meant to be, which is also you know, another great outcome of actually doing an experiment itself. Um, then there's measuring availability. So always try to do it from your customer's viewpoint. That's really important. And then you know, while all this may be complex and you might not have all the answers, especially if it's a new system, it's OK to run a chaos experiment in non-prod before you have all the answers, because it will help you learn about your system, help you discover some of these things, know what the right questions are to ask, and it can actually be a really useful exercise. So next, we'll talk about some best practices when injecting failure. So first of all, you start off by identifying points of failure. You look at your architecture diagram of your system, figure out what could fail, right? 
And then if you do a good job of that, you'll probably end up with quite a long list of, of things that could fail. So then you need to prioritize, because you're not going to start with testing everything. So when you're prioritizing, you want to prioritize based on impact, right? What's the worst thing that could happen if something goes wrong here? As well as the probability of it happening. And when you talk about probability, you know, there's, you want to avoid both sides of the extreme. So if something happens every 30 minutes, there's not really much use in doing a chaos test on it because you might not even call that chaos, right? It's happening already all the time. On the other hand, if it's likely to happen maybe once in 2,000 years, I mean, I'm not saying it's not valuable to run that, but you'll probably find something with a higher ROI somewhere in the middle, like something that happens every six months, something that you know will happen in you know, 30 days from now. Like That's usually your sweet spot in terms of priority. And then just current confidence level, like how much do you know about what will happen if this thing goes wrong? Um, third thing I would say, start simple, even manual. Like there are great tools out there um, you know, for chaos testing and definitely feel free to leverage them. But when you're just starting out, like do something really small and easy and simple because you'll learn a lot from that as well. And we'll get into that soon also. And always like start in non-prod. Yes, running chaos tests in production is cool and fun and you should, and it's actually a best practice. But when you're starting, the first time you're running the experiment, just like you don't release your features directly to prod, at least I hope not, whatever like pre-production clearing and testing you're doing for your features, you wanna do the same thing for your chaos tests as well. Right, because the impact could be potentially catastrophic if you start right away in prod. And then observing outcomes. So you don't want to rely exclusively on whatever you know, system dashboards you already have. You want to consider those dashboards as part of your system under test, part of what you're trying to verify with your chaos test. So you want to have a different way of also verifying what, how your system is behaving. And then just like in a real incident, you would be double checking everything, like are you sure this is up? You know, make sure the website is up, look, is this working? Do the same thing during a chaos test as well. And again, measure from your end user's perspective. So if you have a web application, actually, you know, fire up a web browser and see how it's working, right? Take like a step, as much of a step back as you can. Finally, you need to restore the steady state. Might not be required at all if everything went well and your system is self-healing. But if your chaos test had an expected outcome, you may need to do this. And since you started a non-prod, no need to panic, but you do need to get things back up and running. Um, or two, you knew right away the system wasn't self-healing. There would be some runbook you would need to follow, but you've documented that, and now is your chance to follow that runbook, ensure that it's well-written and well-understood and able to be executed. Next, we'll talk about chaos readiness. So first of all, you need a chaos ready environment. Again, because you're not starting in prod, you do need a prod-like environment in order to start off with your chaos testing. You want it to be as close to prod as possible, right? The further away it is from prod, the more different it is, the more risk you're carrying that your chaos test is not actually doing what you think it's doing. Um, and then prod, safety first, because Often, if your system is very complex and it's hard to set up a non-prod environment, if it's, let's say, a very data-heavy system, you might be actually working on a shared non-prod environment, right? So even though it's non-prod, if you, all developers are blocked for three days because you ran a chaos experiment, the chances of you, you know, being able to do more of this is, is not that high, right? So be careful in non-prod as well. After you test a non-prod, then you can have the information to decide whether you want to move to prod and do this in prod or not. Right? You have to consider the risks of doing it in prod and then also the risks of not doing it in prod. Right? So you have to you know, consider that carefully. Um, next, I'll talk about chaos-ready teams. Right? So first of all, you need a commitment to resiliency and operational excellence. If, for whatever reason, the system that you're talking about actually has known resiliency issues that no one is fixing, there is no point in running a chaos experiment to discover more operational resiliency issues that will just get added to the backlog and no one's gonna fix, right? The one exception there might be if like there are resiliency issues that are coming out in prod, but so far they've been small, no major incidents. Sometimes running a chaos experiment can actually help you bring proof to management that yes, yeah, so far the issues have been small, but if one of them would happen during this high volume day, or if one of them would happen and this thing would go wrong, you could have this major incident and then that can help you get the attention to resiliency that you're trying to get. Um, and then as well, like when it comes to culture, right, um, the team needs to be able to acknowledge, embrace, and mitigate risk, right? Because when you're doing chaos engineering, you're actually discovering risk, right? And if people are risk, like 
not just risk averse, but like afraid of risk and they don't want to know about risk and they'd rather not know, you're not going to have much success with chaos engineering because you're just bringing more bad news that people would rather not know about. Right? And then finally, psychological safety, blameless postmortems, right? You know, when you're doing chaos tests, if you're running them in production, there is always a possibility that something will go wrong, right? Hopefully you've thought about it, you've decided that the benefits of running the chaos task outweigh the risks because the risk of not running the chaos test is also very high. But knowing that you know the finger won't get pointed at you, that people will understand that everyone's doing you know what they think is right for the system and is you know doing things appropriately will help you be able to do chaos tests repeatedly and you know move things forward. Okay, great. So now you have a chaos ready environment, chaos ready team. Now what you need to do is convince your boss. So here are some things you shouldn't say. It's fun. I just read a really great blog post about chaos engineering. It's trending on my Twitter feed. I just saw Bella give a really great talk at Cloud Native Con about it, and I want to try it out. Right? I want to write a really cool blog post. Or I want to get promoted. Right? These are probably not the things that are going to convince your boss to let you do chaos engineering. But there are what I find like two categories of times when there's actually commercial value to doing chaos engineering. And this is a great time to raise your hand and say, hey, let's try it. The first one is before a release, right? Whether it's the first release of your system, you're about to, you're gonna go live soon, or it's the release of a major feature, right? At that point, people are nervous, right? They're looking for confidence. They're looking for a way to make them comfortable that when they go live, something bad won't happen. That's a great time to actually figure out what the points of failure are, trigger those points of failure, ensure that your system can be resilient to them. So that's one category. Second one is after a major incident, right? You have all your postmortem follow-ups. But if you don't actually recreate the trigger that happened in production, how do you know that those are the right follow-ups, right? How do you know that those follow-ups were actually done appropriately? So that's another time when actually saying a chaos test, like let's actually re-trigger that, make that bad thing happen again, and then ensure that we have an incident, or at least that that incident is much smaller than it was previously. And that's also a recommendation that I often give, you know, post incidents. So then, you know, I think is chaos engineering easy or is it hard? And I kind of came to the conclusion that it's both. Um, so here's some reasons why chaos engineering is easy, right? Because first of all, even if you do a manual chaos test, and I'll discuss what that means soon, you can get a lot of value with very, very minimal investment. Also, there's lots of open source and vendor software available. Um, basic use cases, similarly, like tons of blog posts out there, tons of talks. It's easy to like, you know, read up on what you should do. And then four, if you're on the cloud, you know, cloud providers, like because you know, infrastructure is much more you know, democratized, right? Like it could be actually really easy to bring something down you know, with um, APIs and just like easy tools. On the other hand, chaos engineering is also really hard. Right, some of the technical challenges, first of all, chaos tests by definition are system tests, right? And system tests are notoriously a flaky, right? You have all these false positives, you know, things that are like all these moving parts. How do you make sure everything's up and running the way it's supposed to be? Um, so that's one challenge. And then, you know, running in a production parallel environment, which could be an ongoing investment. If you have one already, then great, you'll use it. But then you might be, you know, with other developers like kind of competing for resources. Or you might have to invest in creating a dedicated environment for your chaos tests, and that can require investment. Alternatively, you can use canaries, right? Even though that is already in prod, if you have a mature canarying thing, but there are some like large scale issues that can be difficult to simulate a canary. Um, second, managed services on the cloud. So not just cloud, but actually using like the higher level of abstraction of managed services, very often they abstract away the details, right? It's serverless, right? They're, they're obviously are machines, but you don't have access to them. You can't manipulate them. And that can actually make it really hard to inject a failure and cause something to happen. Another reason why chaos engineering is hard is a human one, right? So there are three virtues of programmers, right? Laziness, impatience, hubris, right? So when you think about laziness, everyone's like, okay, I already have enough chaos without this. Right? If it ain't broke, don't break it. Like, leave me alone. I want to go home. Um, and then there's impatience, right? I want to just code my next feature. I, this is going to take some of my time. And then hubris, right? My code won't break, right? I already wrote code to handle this, this scenario, you know, two years ago. 
Right? It might be true. Have you tested it recently? Right? You know, as we all know, it's always a moving target and things change and the environment changes. Okay, so now we'll go actually into a case study. So this is a um, simplified, you know, slightly modified architecture of a real system in pre-prod at Goldman Sachs. So if we go through, you know, the architecture, on the right-hand side you have an API gateway, which is proxying, validating, authenticating um, You have a service running an ECS Fargate, right, three different tasks running in different availability zones. We're using OPA, Open Policy Agent, to, tax, to check entitlements. And then we have an Elastic Search instance, which searches across different documents. And then as well, there's Redis, which is a dependency for some types of requests. So when we were looking at doing chaos engineering, we went through this diagram, figured out points of failure across all the different um, components, and then proceeded from there. So some points of failure, right? The Redis, for example, was supposed to be a soft dependency. Um, for most requests. Um, so, you know, well, what happens? Is it really a soft dependency? Perhaps it accidentally turned into a hard dependency. That would be one thing to look at, right? Elasticsearch, what if it goes down? What if some of the nodes go down, right? Um, OPA, right, the entitlement system. What if, you know, what if that gets disconnected? Like, we know that we can't operate without entitlements, but can we, like, recover from that? How quickly can we recover once it comes back up? And then finally, you know, on the Fargate side, our tasks are going down. How are we going to be able to handle that? Now, these are all like real points of failure and things that can go wrong. But again, right, challenges on the modern cloud. How are you going to simulate these things? You don't have any machines to bring down, right? I mean, there are machines, but you don't have access to them. You don't know where they are, who they are, how, how you would be able to manipulate them. So how can you inject chaos? So there are three ways. Three things that I call chaos scenes that you can use to inject chaos, even when you're running managed services in the cloud. Right, first category is you're using cloud APIs and functionality. So if we take Elasticsearch as an example, even if you're running on a fully managed cluster with no access to the underlying machines, right, there are usually APIs that let you trigger, right, a cluster resize, right? So that can actually be a really useful chaos scene where you can trigger that cluster resize, have traffic coming in, and see how you're um, your system reacts to those circumstances, right? Two, trigger known weaknesses, right? So I like to say you look at the documentation, all the things it says that are best practices, and you do the opposite, right? So it says don't run this, you know, resource-intensive query. Make sure never to run of query against your, your elastic search instance. And you go, okay, you write up that query, run it, right? And non fraud right? And see what actually happens, right? You might find the entire cluster goes down. How can you, re how can you recover from that, right? That can be another really useful real-life way to chaos without access to the machines. Third of all, disrupting network connectivity. So you have multiple managed services that are talking to each other, right? You can actually use an IAC to actually, you know, create a network black hole so the services can't talk to each other. Right, that can also be a pretty generic and powerful way to inject chaos into your system. So now we'll dig into the ECS um, Fargate use case. That was the thing we decided to start with because it's you know, relatively simple. So what is AWS ECS? It's Elastic Container Service, fully managed container orchestration on AWS. You can either run on EC2 instances, in which case it's not fully, fully managed and you have access to the underlying machines, or you can go serverless with ECS Fargate. So ECS Fargate is serverless container orchestration. You're just going to define your tasks, the tasks like a pod in Kubernetes. Um, and then for resiliency, you obviously want to configure your cluster to be running across multiple availability zones in AWS. So then the question becomes, what happens if a task goes down? Well, I mean, all the good things should happen, right? You automatically bring up a new one to replace the one that stopped. But that opens up a bunch of questions. How long is that going to take? What if multiple tasks stop? Right? How is your application going to behave in the interim? And if there is like impact, how long will it take for you to recover? So you can read the documentation, you can guess, or you can try it. And that's what we did. So when I talk about starting simple, this is what I mean. Right? There might be amazing tools out there that you might want to use soon or eventually to do this in an automated fashion. But you, when you're starting, like start simple. Even in non prod right, just start simple. You can actually go to the console or run a simple um, API command or something on the AWS CLI and just stop a task, right? And what you learn from that is actually huge. 
And you'll see we learned a lot just from doing that once. So simple experiment, valuable findings. What we found was that there was actually a 20% error rate for between three and 10 minutes. Um, the failed requests were returning 502s, bad gateway errors. But on the good side, the system was able to return to steady state without any outside intervention. So what happened, right? Well, obviously, we, we know what happened. <laughs> you know, we stopped an ECS task, right? Um, so one of those three tasks was down. The network load balancer, though, was still sending traffic to the bad task, right, for a few minutes until the health check for that task finally failed, and it was brought out of rotation. So how would you solve for something like that? Right, so first of all, you can increase the number of tasks, right? Three tasks is not very much. You can scale it up to hundreds, and then the, the risk or the impact from a single task going down is negligible. Right, but that's a cost versus resiliency trade-off. Depending on how much resiliency you need, you, you might choose to pay for more tasks or not. Two is you can tune the time out of your load balancer so that you remove tasks that are not responding more quickly. That's also a trade-off because you might end up with churn, right? Like, you know, you remove the task, it really would have come up on its own, things like that. So there's always trade-offs and tuning that goes on here. Um, but the second really interesting thing that we found was the dashboards. So on the left-hand side, you can see a big green smiley face because the system dashboard said everything is good. All the requests that are seen by this dashboard are returning successful responses. Right, but that's not what our customers were seeing. Right? On the right, you see actually we were using Locust, the load testing tool, to simulate the production traffic. And there, again, testing from the customer's perspective, we were seeing errors. So what was happening there was that the dashboards were pulling data from an agent that was running alongside the ECS task. When the task went down, the agent went down, and it start, stopped reporting those metrics. Right? And therefore, you didn't see those errors at all. So lessons learned, one, Try to make sure your monitoring is decoupled from your service. Two, and this is exactly what we did, test your dashboards and alerting regularly with real you know, production like incident-like scenarios. And then three, monitor from your customer's perspective using things like synthetic probes. And then finally, a fundamental question. Is this an incident? Right? And the answer is it really depends. Right? What are your SLOs? What are your service? What are your customers' expectations? Is three minutes 80%? Like, it really depends. And this actually having this graph in front of you, having a real thing that happened, you know, maybe inviting your customers to come test with you in non-prod can actually help you clarify some of these things before you know, fingers are being pointed, before there's actually a real incident happening live in production. Um, so that concludes the case study, and now we'll go to takeaways. Um, so first of all, getting started with chaos engineering does not need to be difficult, it doesn't require fancy tools. Um, if you want to be successful, ensure that your chaos tests are aligned with real business needs and requirements. And three, after major incidents, strongly consider including a chaos test as a post-mortem follow-up to prevent a recurrence. Um, and this is just about Goldman Sachs engineering. We have a bunch of uh, engineering tenets. I highlighted the few that I thought were particularly relevant to chaos engineering in this talk. Um, and now I'll stop and I'll take any questions. Thank you, everybody. It's a great presentation, I especially like the slide, how to convince your boss. Right? <laughs> so sure. my question is, um, especially in the serverless uh, functions that we write, right? Um, can you talk a little more on how do you do the chaos engineering, especially where you have very low visibility or almost like zero visibility into the infrastructure, right? Because you don't know where your functions are running. So did you guys do any deeper onto that. Can you talk a little more on it? Sure, so you're saying, just, just to make sure I understand the question, you're saying it's, it's serverless and you don't have access to the underlying infrastructure. Right. Can I talk more about how to do chaos engineering? Right, yeah, because you have very low visibility onto it um, underneath where, where, where things are running. Sure, so I think the first and like the, the high level answer is that to do chaos engineering, you don't necessarily need the visibility into the infrastructure, right? You need a visibility into how your customers are viewing your system, right? So what you do need is access to do something bad, 
right? So however you actually choose to achieve that, typically, right, previously it was done on the infrastructure level because that's like really generic. You can, you bring down a machine, it impacts anything, right? But now that we're moving to the higher abstractions, that becomes harder to do. So with ECS tasks, I think the example there is clear. For Lambda, there are ways that you can actually inject, you know, latency into your Lambda. You can actually, like, put things in front of it to, like, simulate failures. But the truth is that it is more challenging, right, with serverless to actually inject these failures and to make things fail so realistically. Um, and I wish I had, like, all the answers, um, and I don't. Um, but, but, yeah, like, there are, you know, there are ways that you can actually go and, you know, whether it's network, right, putting something, like, disrupting the network so you can't reach the Lambda, right, your customer can't reach the Lambda even though it's up and running, or whether it's, you know, putting something in the Lambda that, like, lets you for certain requests fail, or for certain requests, you know, inject latency, right? Those are some of the strategies that we use. I hope that helps. Thank you. Hello. There are different type of failures that you can simulate. Have you ever simulated a, a failure that could affect data consistency? That's a great and question. Um, I personally haven't simulated it. I've definitely seen incidents um, where, you know, like databases uh, did funny things and you know, didn't operate according, but it, that's, that's definitely a really valuable thing to do for chaos engineering. It's one of the most dangerous things because you can't yes. recover, like recovering the data is hard. Um, and definitely, you know, definitely a scenario worth testing. I can't give you personal, uh, a personal fun anecdote here though. So thank you. Hey, so thank you for this. Um, so in terms of chaos uh, testing in pre-prod, you need to simulate stuff, which means you need to do load testing because not everything happens just because it's in a browser, right? One person at a time. So in terms of uh, simulating load tests, uh, how have you found that just capturing network traffic, you know, especially on new features, that doesn't exist yet? You know, if, if something's already in production, you can kind of capture a sample and then, and then sanitize it and stuff. But like, how, how have you found to speed up the process where the, the chaos testing that you have to do in non-prod does rely on a load test? And sometimes that's not just as easy as like capturing traffic and then replaying it. Have you found ways to speed up that loop to get to a simulator, a re-simulatable state that requires load testing, which is not easy? Right, it's definitely a challenging um, issue. I think once you're in prod, but you can use things like fingerprinting. Well, fingerprinting is more like for the data, shape of the data, but like you can, you can replay more easily, right? You can record what's actually there in prod, put that down, and then replay it in non-prod, right? Like it's a little bit hard to, um, to know what your traffic will look like once you're in prod, and it's really just about best guesses, um, which is why like in general, you wanna move incrementally and release to prod even in small increments, right, as quickly as you can, so you can get real life feedback. But yeah, I don't have a magic, magic answer there. Okay, uh, so how much time do you invest in researching, reviewing, investigating the results after a chaos test? That's a great question. So it actually is um, a very, very large part of the chaos testing. And that's why I said before, like if there isn't a, business use case attached to it, like it'll often just like fizzle out, right? You did the chaos test, you found some things, but like nobody's like really interested enough to, to dig into it if it's not material, right? If it's not something that people actually care about. But yeah, I mean, it's just like a post, like if you had a real production incident, you would spend, right? The production incident is stressful. And then you could spend months afterwards like cleaning up and doing all the follow-ups. Similar for a chaos test as well. There's a lot of time that goes into the, into the follow-ups there too. Hi, um, just a quiz, quick question. How do you involve to the ops team where you are uh, testing or making chaos in, in non-production environments? Uh, for example, when you need to analyze the root cause analysis of the, of the team? I don't know if you understand my question. Maybe just repeat it. You want to know how we interact with how the ops team? How do you involve the ops team where you are testing in a non-production environment? Sure, so depending on the structure of the team, right, often the ops team will be involved in the non-prod environment as well. Um, so if that's the case, then that's great. But definitely, like, you need to involve your ops team, right, because they're the ones who know what's going on from an ops perspective. And 
let's actually, what I find is a very good outcome of chaos tests is that you bring everyone together, right? And like a kind of under a less, much less stressful than a prod incident. Everyone, everyone comes together for a prod incident, right? But it's not the most pleasant time for everyone to get together. You get everybody together for a chaos test, you know, everyone starts talking to each other and you often uncover like disconnects and understanding, right? Where ops thinks that like, you know, you're doing X and dev thinks you're doing Y and then they realize that, oh, well, actually, we've been, right, like completely misunderstanding each other the whole time. So definitely, you want to involve ops. Um, often, they're involved in non-prod anyways, and even if they're not, get them involved, right? Like, make it, and hopefully, I find that ops people are actually often more, even more excited about chaos engineering than the devs sometimes, because it's like, you know, more up their alley, and they're very often really happy and excited to have somebody proactively looking at ops type things. So, yeah. So, my question, uh, sure. just adding to what uh, he has asked. One of the often challenge we face is that we require access or admin access for carrying out this thing. I understand that pre-prod or lower environment is easy, but Goldman Sachs, how you are planning to do in the prod, because that requires probably beyond VP level approval to touch anything, right? Sure, so it's, it's definitely a challenge. There's two paths. This is that there's the access side, like the, the technical part of like, does somebody have access? And typically, somebody will have access, right? There, like, there will be somebody who has that access. So then getting that person to actually participate. And then there's the flip side, which is not the technical part of getting access, but the like, organizational part, which is like, if you're going to do a chaos test in production, you want to have like a go, no go type of meeting with everybody in the room, right? You don't, don't chaos test alone. For sure not in prod, right? Just like you, before you release, you have a go, no go, like should we do this, should we not do this? Same thing. Write down your plans, get everybody in a room, have everybody sitting there, you know, virtually or in reality, and then have the person with permissions press the button, right? And then the, the other pro of that is that if something goes wrong, anybody who's needed to actually resolve the incident is already in the room, eyes on it. You're not going to waste the 20 minutes that sometimes happens until you page the right person to actually get on, on on the call and starting to fix things. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, my question is, are there any new developments, like tools, techniques in this space that you're finding interesting? Um, are there any new tools and techniques that... Yeah, in the uh, uh, chaos engineering space, any new developments that you find particularly interesting? That we're, that we're planning on using or that we... Uh, yeah, perhaps, that you're looking at, uh, perhaps instrument for implementing. Right, so, um, you know, I know AWS is coming out with a lot of, like, FIS, their fourth injection um, service, so we were looking into that as well. Um, I think they were starting with a lot of network disruptions. Um, there's definitely a lot happening, like, in the space. Um, what I find is interesting, honestly, is, like, a lot of tools start with the simple things, Right? And then, like, kind of stop. Because the other stuff is really hard, right? So I think, like, what would be great is, you know, kind of getting together and, and slowly getting a library where we actually also solve the more complex problems, right? Rather than everyone kind of writing their own new chaos tool that starts and does bring down EC2 instance, stop the ECS task, and then kind of fizzles out because the other stuff is too hard. If you can kind of unite and get to, you know, the more complex and meaty problems, that would definitely be a great, great outcome. Uh, so a lot of the, so we were talking about like manual chaos tests and stuff like that. What about moving to like automating the chaos test? Like what are some of the things that you have to keep in mind? And I guess like how do you ensure that you're always watching uh, the automated chaos tests that are running? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so automating is definitely very valuable. Um, it is a system test. Right? So let's say a lot of what's suggested is running as part of your, your CI CD pipeline. Right? You have a chaos testing step. Um, some of the challenges there are, again, the false positives. Right? So when you're running it once, you can set things up, you can make sure everything's running. What we found to be a challenge a lot of your automating chaos tests is like, you know, things are down not because of your chaos, not because of the test, not because your system changed, just because of the environment. Right? You're usually not running in prod, so that's like one challenge. Um, the other challenge is like, you know, determining, and that's why running manually first helps, you need to have, when you're automating, a pass-fail threshold, 
right? You need to have like that, that binary, like yes or no, we either passed or failed. And when you're running manually, you can look at it and kind of tune that and figure out where that should be. Um, but if you set that too aggressive, you're gonna have a lot of false positives also, right? You say, oh, we only want 99.9% .9 of requests every single time that we run our chaos test in our CI CD pipeline, you're probably gonna end up with lots of build failures and everyone's just gonna start ignoring that, right? So you wanna set it, you wanna make sure you have a really stable environment to run it in, and you wanna set your bar low enough that you won't have false positives. Um, and then you also might wanna consider, you know, running it if you're not doing really continuous delivery, you might wanna consider running it just before a release. Not every day or you know every hour or every for sure not like every build like have mercy on your developers. Thank you, Bella. Thank you, everyone, for coming. You. If you have questions, you can come after that. Sure. We are done. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.